Okay, this is our last lecture. This is the Civil War and Reconstruction. Um, Civil War, as we noted last time, began in April of 1861, and with the South attacking um, Fort Sumter in uh, South Carolina. When the war begins, um, the North really did seem to have the majority of advantages here. Um, let's note that the North has the advantage in population. 75% of all Americans live in the North. It's going to be easier for the North to uh, put together an effective army to fund that army, to fund the war, and to supply the, to supply the troops. The North has the advantage in money. 80% of the people's money is deposited in Northern banks. Uh, most of the wealth of the country is in the North. And again, that's going to be an advantage in being able to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to pay for this war. The North has the advantage in manufacturing, which made sense because uh, industrialization, when it, uh, uh, when it begins uh, in the early part of that century, is focused primarily on the North. Uh, it's the North that has the factories, the manufacturing. Uh, the North will have the ability then to, uh, to manufacture the, um, uh, the, the equipment that they're going to need to fight this conflict. But it may surprise you to know that the North also has the advantage in agricultural output. Um, you, know, you may have 90% of the nation's manufacturing in the North, um, but even though the South had remained rural, 75% of the nation's food producing farms are in the North, not the South. Uh, you know, the South is concentrating on the cash crops, cotton, uh, tobacco, right? Sugar. What are you going to do with those things in a war, right? You need food for your troops. Uh, the North will have the advantage in food production. Uh, the North has the advantage in transportation. Um, about two thirds of all the nation's rail lines are in the North. It will give the North the ability to move troops and supplies um, and equipment around much easier than in, than the South. And the North also has the advantage in weaponry. Uh, the North has the uh, resources of the United States Army. They've got about $2.3 million worth of weaponry. Uh, the South has just what their volunteer soldiers are bringing from home. They have about $73,000 worth of weapons in the South. But, but we should note that the South does have one strong advantage. The South has the better military leadership. Um, some of the Army's best generals were from the South, and um, as the Southern states seceded from the Union, many of those generals resigned their commissions and um, went, went South to fight, uh, including the South's commanding general, Robert E. Lee, who, although he loved the Army, um, felt more loyalty to his state of Virginia than he felt to the United States. As the war begins then, both sides have a strategy, a way that they hope this war will, will uh, turn out. The northern strategy is, is known as the Anaconda Plan. An anaconda is a big old snake that uh, surrounds its, its, um, its victim and squeezes them to death and then eats them. Um, and so in a sense, that, that's the northern strategy, uh, as you can see on this map. Um, the Anaconda Plan included, the, included naval blockades, you know, put the U.S. Navy in place to blockade the southern Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico to keep supplies from getting into the south from either the north or from Europe. Um, the north wants to gain control of the Mississippi River and Ohio River here uh, to, um, to, to divide the south, uh, in a sense, to, to block uh, Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas from being able to uh, to get into the to the deep south and, and really play a role in those battles. Uh, if they also can control the Mississippi and the Ohio River, that's another transportation, uh, another link in the transportation network for the North. Um, and then hopefully they, or they they hope that they can kind of concentrate the battles in the deep south, um, defeating the 
the South in their own home territory in places like Alabama and Georgia, Mississippi, and Virginia. Um, the South followed a strategy that some have called the Eastern strategy. Uh, they, they hoped to concentrate most of the fighting. Um, let me get some. They hope to concentrate most of their fighting here in Virginia uh, between Washington, D.C. and Richmond, Virginia, uh, the Union capital and the Confederate capital. That's where Robert E. Lee's forces were the strongest. Um, they hope that they can put pressure on the, the government in Washington, um, maybe force Lincoln to have to uh, to, to leave the capital, um, maybe even take control of Washington, D.C. And, and, and they figure that if they can get control of Washington, D.C., um, that, um, that the North would abandon the fight and maybe sue for peace. Uh, in addition, taking control of the Union capital might show their strength to, uh, to European nations. And, and the, the, the Confederacy was kind of hoping um, that, that either Britain or maybe France uh, would come to their aid and assistance in this battle, but uh, that will never happen. Now, we should note that at first, both sides thought that this war would be quick and easy uh, over in just a couple of months. But they were wrong, because it will very quickly become apparent that war that this war would not be won easily, that this war would be a long and bloody slog to the end. Um, and as we noted, this war will last for four long years. We should also note that in so many ways, this war was for the United States the first modern war. In other words, the first war fought after industrialization. So it's the first American war to rely on railroads for transporting troops and supplies. It's the first American war to rely on the telegraph for communications. It is the first American war to rely on mass produced weapons, you know, guns that were made in factories uh, rather than and handmade one by one by a gunsmith. And it's the first war to be, to be fought in the United States after the invention of photography. And so we have a lot of pictures. We have visual documents of this war that, uh, that, that make it a lot more personal. Because so many soldiers, before they, uh, after they enlisted, before they reported for duty, would, would, would have their photographs taken so that they could leave some kind of memento for their families in case they never came back. Take a look at the faces. We can see the faces of these men, sometimes just boys, um, who, who were going to war. We see pictures from the battlefields, uh, the aftermath of battles, dead bodies lined up, waiting to be taken for burial. The grisly truth of war death, the destruction, the, the loss of human beings. Um, you know, these, these photographs um, are powerful in, in bringing war home to, to people. You know, war was traditionally just fought out on the battlefield and you never really had to think about the human consequences so much, you know. But, but the photographs from this war make it real and, and, and again, bring home the grisly consequences of war, which is death and destruction. Let's note that most of the early battles were won by southern troops. Uh, the North had a hard time finding the right commanding general. Um, Lincoln fired several who he didn't think were doing a very good job. He didn't settle on Ulysses S. Grant as the Union commander until about a year before the war was over. Um, 
but the turning point in this war will come in 1863. And that turning point is at the Battle of Gettysburg. The Battle of Gettysburg um, was fought in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, up here. This is as far north as the southern troops will, will ever get in this, in this war. Um, Gettysburg was a three-day long battle over a 4th of July weekend that the South was expected to win, but, but the North pulled out a victory. And after the Battle of Gettysburg, we start to see the North now starting to win most of the big battles. And if the South did win after 1863, they usually paid a very, very high price in casualties for those victories. And so after 1863, this war begins to tilt in favor now of the Union. I just put a couple of other pictures here from this, from the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, the Army Field Hospital one absolutely fascinates me and just brings home how primitive, how primitive medicine used to be not that long ago. But after the Battle of Gettysburg, we are also going to see another type of strategy in a sense used in this conflict and that is total war total war the idea of total war was something that had been uh, written about by a german general uh, in, a, in a in a book that he published earlier in the century about how modern wars how industrialized wars would be fought um, he argued that in modern warfare, you can't just defeat your enemy's army. You have to defeat their entire society. Yeah, the, the, the war is not confined to the battlefield. You have to take it into the cities, into, the, into their homes, in a sense. You have to destroy your enemy's cities, wreck and plunder their properties, kill the civilians. The war must affect not just soldiers, but women and children and old people at home as well. It's kind of a scorched earth policy. You know, nothing should remain standing in the wake of your army. And there's probably no better example of total war in the Civil War than the events known as Sherman's March to the Sea. Union General William Sherman um, took his armies to Atlanta, Georgia, where he captured the city, burned the city, and then divided his troops up and began marching them south. Uh, they would march from, uh, I can't get my cursor, sorry. Um, they would march from Atlanta south to Savannah, in other words, to the sea, 250 miles uh, from Atlanta to Savannah, um, basically destroying anything that got in their way. Uh, fields would be uh, plundered for the food and then burned. Houses would be burned and the civilians left on their own. Once they reached Savannah, they took their army north and continued the destruction into South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. Total war overwhelms the South. Many Southern soldiers deserted. They go home to protect their homes and their families. In so many ways, in the end, the Northern victory is, is one of a stronger army over a weaker army. Because although the South started strong, Southern troop strength peaked in 1863 when they had half a million Southerners in uniform and fighting. After 1863, especially after total war began to dominate the, uh, to dominate the battles, 
um, Southern troop strength decreased dramatically. As I said, so many will either be killed in battle or leave. And, and so by the end of the war, we don't really know how many Southern troops were left. The, the, the record keeping is was not good. And, but, but I'm going to guess that, that the South may have had maybe half by the end of the war of the troops that they'd started with. The Northern Army started small but grew big. Uh, when, when the war began in 1861, the, 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 the American Army was was small, let's just face it. It had maybe 118,000 troops. Um, but Lincoln called for volunteers. Um, there was a draft. Um, and, uh, and, and by 1865, the Northern Army numbered over one million. Southerners could not withstand the hardships brought on by total war and the massive numbers of Union troops. And the war will come to an end in April of 1865 when Southern General Robert E. Lee surrendered to Union General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox, Virginia, bringing this fight to an end. In the end, slavery was abolished. Now, we are generally taught that slavery was ended with the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln freed the slaves with the Emancipation Proclamation during the war. But that's not quite right. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in January of 1863, an executive order that freed the slaves in the rebelling states. It, um, it did not affect slaves that might have been living, say, in Missouri, a slave state that had stayed in the Union. Um, it freed the slaves in the rebelling states. But, but, but do you think that people in the rebelling states are going to say, oh, wait, Lincoln just freed the slaves, so I'm going to let them go? They don't recognize Lincoln as any authority over them. But what the Emancipation Proclamation did do is turn this war into a war to free the slaves. Because the only way now to free the slaves in the rebelling states was for the North to win the war. To, to go into the South, to, to liberate slaves, to help them escape, and to, to, to rescue the runaways. You have to defeat the South. You have to make the South surrender to the North before the Emancipation Proclamation actually has any teeth. So this is extremely important because it did turn this war war that had begun over containment of slavery, a war that the North saw as necessary for the preservation of the Union, it, it turned the war into a war to end slavery. And officially, slavery would be ended with the adoption of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution that was ratified in December of 1865. I'm going to kind of take it easy in looking at Reconstruction. We are really at the end of the course and we're all kind of exhausted. Um, so let me kind of briefly touch on a few things that, uh, that are important for us to understand about Reconstruction. Uh, the, the the bringing back of the southern states into the union. You've got to, you know, you've got to to get these states back into the union. Essentially, get their representatives back to Washington. Um, you know, begin to act as one country again. Um, and so, Reconstruction takes place over eight, from 1865 to 1877. Now, let us note that just one week after the war ended, uh, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated first president ever to be murdered. His vice president, Andrew Johnson, became president. 
and so it's Johnson's job now to pick up where Lincoln had left off and trying to figure out how to bring these southern states back into the Union. Now, Johnson is a Democrat, where Lincoln had been a Republican, remember? And Johnson was also a Southerner. He was from Tennessee, a state that had seceded. So what is Andrew Johnson doing as Abraham Lincoln's vice president? Well, even when Tennessee had left the Union, Johnson, who was a senator from that state, stayed loyal to the United States. He continued to do his job, going to, going to the Senate every day and voting. And so in 1864, for Lincoln's re-election campaign, the Republicans decided to add this Democrat, who was still loyal to the Union, to the ticket with Lincoln in hopes of attracting other Democrats um, in the North um, who would see that as, a, as an attempt to bring the country, kind of to unite the country in many ways and help Lincoln's re-election campaign. No one ever expected Andrew Johnson to become president, but with Lincoln's assassination, he did. Uh, and again, let's also note for the timeline, it is 1865 that the 13th Amendment to the Constitution is ratified and slavery is officially ended. So, so Andrew Johnson comes up with some reconstruction policies. Um, but, but by 1866, it was pretty clear that, that, that those policies weren't really working the way they wanted them to. Um, Congress, with a majority of Republicans, um, feared that the South is going to try to reestablish slavery by some other name. And in 1866, their worst fears were, um, were realized when Southern states began to pass black codes. Now you remember, uh, we, we talked about slave codes earlier in the semester, laws that Southern states put in effect to regulate the behavior of slaves. The black codes that were being passed in the South uh, were laws that were designed to regulate the behavior of the now freed slaves the freed slaves now of the, of the South. And some of these black codes were pretty suspicious. It's, it's pretty clear. They're, they're trying to figure out how to, to guarantee white supremacy, how to, how to kind of keep, keep blacks in some type of oppressed state, if not full out slavery. Let me give you some examples. Uh, in some Southern states, an unemployed black person could be arrested. Um, they could be fined for vagrancy and then hired out to a private employer to work until the fine was paid. I'm sorry, forced work? That's like, you know, slavery. Um, in some southern states, blacks could not own a farm. They could not buy property. They, they could not take a job other than a job as plantation worker or domestic servant, which was how they had been employed during slavery. I mean, white Southerners are trying their hardest to, to put together some system that would keep blacks oppressed. And, and so Congress is going to respond to the black codes in 1866 by first passing the nation's very first Civil Rights Act, Civil Rights Act of 1866. And the Civil Rights Act declared that blacks were citizens of the United States and that the federal government would protect their rights as citizens. Now, why was it necessary for Congress to make a law that says blacks were citizens? Because you remember the Dred Scott case. The Supreme Court in 1857 had ruled that blacks were not citizens of the United States. So the Civil Rights Act is Congress saying, yes, they are. They are citizens of the United States and they have rights as citizens. 
Just after the Civil Rights Act was passed, Congress also will pass the 14th Amendment to the Constitution and send it to the states for ratification. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution will constitutionally define American citizenship. It states that anyone born in the United States is automatically a citizen. It is 1867 before Congress actually begins to put together their reconstruction policies, although the President Andrew Johnson had been trying to veto them as fast as Congress could pass them. Congressional reconstruction will place federal troops in the South for the first time since the war. Federal troops that were there to try to protect black citizens, to allow black men to vote, to try to ensure that that, um, that blacks are given some type of protection from the uh, from the, the white Southerners. Um, but it's going to be a long, slow slog before the states finally begin to come back into the Union. Now in 1868, Congress is going to impeach Andrew Johnson, and there is a link in the folder that will give you a short video over that. Um, Andrew Johnson is the first U.S. president ever to have been impeached, which means you charge the official with violations of the Constitution. Uh, so he was impeached by the House of Representatives. He was tried in the Senate, but he was not convicted. And he does finish out the rest of his term. But in 1868, the nation elected uh, former General Ulysses S. Grant as president, commander of the Union forces. Uh, who will serve eight years in one of the most corrupt administrations in American history. Grant himself was not corrupt, but the people in his administration were. Lots of them. But in 1870, we do see another amendment to the Constitution added. The 15th Amendment to the Constitution. That guarantees the right to vote to all men. Regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. By 1876, all of the southern states had uh, slowly come back into the Union. 1876 was a presidential election year. Let's just, let me just kind of do it like I would have done in class. In 1876, the United States had endured a bloody civil war and 11 years of reconstruction. All of the southern states had been readmitted to the Union, but, but federal troops were still stationed in three of them. Federal troops were still stationed in South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana, again, protecting um, African Americans from white violence, trying to ensure that African American men could vote, which was important to the Republican majority Congress because African American men were voting for Republicans, the party of Lincoln, of course, and thus they were Republican governments in those last three southern states, South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida. And all the others, though, when the troops had been removed, white southern Democrats had regained power and were beginning to pass laws to once again oppress and restrict the rights of African Americans. Now, Ulysses S. Grant in 76 was the, um, was the president. He'd served two terms. And although he thought about um, trying for a third term, breaking that two-term tradition, uh, he decided ultimately not to run again. And his administration had been too 
uh, damaged by the scandals and corruption of the people that he had around him. And so the Republicans nominated as their candidate in 1876, Rutherford B. Hayes, who was a three-term governor of Ohio. Now, the Republicans had, run every, had won every election since, uh, every presidential election since the Civil War. Um, the Democratic Party was still associated with, with the slaveholding South. Um, and, and so really for Hayes, you know, his biggest qualification was simply that he was a Republican. Um, you know, it, it, it was, it was almost, it seemed almost inevitable that he would win. But the Democrats in 76 nominated Samuel J. Tilden, who was the governor of New York and whose administration in New York had been noted for fighting corruption. Now again, no Democrat had been elected to the presidency since before the Civil War, but, but after those corrupt grant years, eight years of corruption under a Republican president, um, this Democrat Tilden, a reformer, sounded pretty good to some people. Now the campaign itself was your typical kind of negative, dirty, nasty campaign as the Democrats reminded Americans of the eight years of corruption during the Grant administration and the Republicans reminded the nation that the Democrats had started the Civil War. But when the votes were tallied, it looked like Tilden had won. Tilden, the Democrat, won the popular vote. Take a look at that uh, in that chart up there under popular vote. He has about 200,000 more votes than, than Hayes. And it looked as though the uh, that, that he also had that Tilden also had the uh, the electoral college all sewn up. It looked like it was going to be 204 electoral votes for Tilden and 165 for Hayes. Looked like they'd elected a Democrat, but Tilden had won in those last three southern states where federal troops were still stationed. He had won in South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana. Republican party leaders were pretty astonished at that. How could that have been? You know, they, they've still got those troops in place that were supposed to be protecting uh, black voters who, would, who should have been voting Republican. And, um, and after some messages back and forth to those state governors from the party, South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana announced that, oh, they've made a mistake. But they must have, you know, they must have counted their votes wrong. That Tilden didn't win their states. That Hayes did. Now, if that was true, then that would shift the electoral college vote. It would make it 185 for Hayes, 184 for Tilden. 185 was just exactly what you needed to win. So South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana sent two sets of of election returns to the officials in Washington, D.C. They wouldn't decide. They'd just send the, both of these sets of returns up to Washington. One set of returns would give the presidency to Tilden. The other set of returns would give the presidency to Hayes. A special commission was established in Washington to try to determine which set of returns were valid and 15 people were going to sit on that commission. Five members of the commission would be senators, five members would come from the House of Representatives, and five members 
would come from the Supreme Court. Now, as they chose their commission members, seven of them were Democrats, seven of them were Republican, and one, a Supreme Court justice, was independent. He didn't belong to either party. And it didn't take that guy too long to figure out that he was going to be the guy who had to decide the entire election of 1876 because, you know, it was pretty much guaranteed the other guys will vote for their party. And he doesn't like that, so he got himself appointed to a Senate seat in his home state. He left the court and left the commission. There were no more independents in the court. And so the replacement was a Republican. And will it surprise anybody to know that the commission then voted along strict party lines, eight to seven, to accept the returns that will make Rutherford B. Hayes president of the United States. Now historians agree that this election was fraudulent that this election, that, that, that the Republicans messed with this election to get Hayes in office. And, you know, you kind of have to, have to wonder, why didn't the Democrats challenge the, uh, the commission's decision? Why did they just let Hayes become president? And the answer to that is because they made a deal. They made a deal. Both sides agreed that the Democratic Party would not challenge the results of this election. But as soon as he became president, Hayes would remove the last of the federal troops from the South. He would remove those troops from South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana which will allow white Democrats to regain power in those states. The deal is called the Compromise of 1877, and this marks the official end of Reconstruction. Now, what do I want you to know from all of this? Um, the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. Again, take a look at that video link that uh, will detail that first impeachment of an American president. Um, understand the black codes. What, what, was, what was the South trying to do um, with those laws that tried to regulate the behavior of, of freed African Americans? But I absolutely want you to know these three amendments to the Constitution that resulted from the Civil War and Reconstruction. There will be questions on each of these. So know that the 13th Amendment to the Constitution abolished slavery in the United States. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution for the first time in the Constitution will define American citizenship. Anyone born in the United States is automatically a citizen. All citizens, whether born or naturalized, are entitled to due process and equal protection under the law. And the 15th Amendment, that no adult male can be denied the right to vote because of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, black voting rights. And that, folks, is all that I have. That's History 1301. It's been the weirdest semester of my life, and yours probably. Uh, but I thank you for your attention and your work, both in person and online. Um, final exam will be available beginning Monday, May the 4th, through Wednesday, May the 6th. I'll make sure you have a little more detailed information about that coming up this week but uh, but again it's it's 
been quite a semester. So again, thank you for your attention and be well.